Good day, my name is Priscilla and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the KLA Corporation December Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call and Webcast. All participant lines have been placed in a listen-only mode to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question at that time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Lastly, if you should need operator assistance, please press star zero. Thank you. I will now turn the call over to Kevin Kessel, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you and welcome to KLA's Fiscal Q2 2021 Quarterly Earnings Call to discuss the results of the December quarter and the outlook for the March quarter. With me today is Rick Wallace, our Chief Executive Officer, and Brent Higgins, our Chief Financial Officer. During today's call, we will discuss quarterly results for the period ended December 31st, 2020, that we released today after the market closed in the form of a press release, shareholder letter, and slide deck. All are available on the KLA IR section of our website. Today's discussion is presented on a non-GAAP financial basis unless otherwise specified. A detailed reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP results is in today's earnings material posted on our website. Today's call also represents the end of the calendar year. We will make references to both 2020 and 2021. Please note all references are for the calendar year. Our IR website also contains future virtual investor conferences, as well as presentations, corporate governance information, and links to our SEC filings, including our most recent annual report and quarterly reports on Forms 10-K and 10-Q. Our comments today are subject to risks and uncertainties reflected in the risk factor disclosure in our SEC filings. Any forward-looking statements, including those we make on the call today, are subject to those risks, and KLA cannot guarantee those forward-looking statements will come true. Our actual results may differ significantly from those projected in our forward-looking statements. As many of you now know, we changed the format of our earnings two quarters ago to include pre-publishing a detailed shareholder letter that provides updates on our business performance. The pre-publishing allows this call to be efficient by providing more streamlined comments while also freeing up more time for your questions and answers. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to our President and Chief Executive Officer, Rick Wallace. Thanks, Kevin, and thank you for joining us today and for your interest in KLA. As we reflect on the accomplishments of 2020, it's important for me to first appreciate and acknowledge the global KLA team. Your perseverance, drive to be better, and determination enabled KLA to rise to the challenge and deliver for our customers. 2020 was like no other year we have seen, and while our teams have not been physically together for the most part, our company continues to demonstrate the great KLA culture of collaboration and innovation and is emerging stronger than ever. In the process, we delivered exceptionally strong financial results in the December quarter, closing a strong year for the company. In our shareholder letter published today, we articulate how KLA's record results are driven by success on multiple fronts, including the resourcefulness of our global workforce, the resiliency of our business model, and our commitment to returning value to our shareholders. As most of you have already seen from our results, 2020 was an impressive year for KLA on multiple fronts. We delivered strong growth, profitability, and free cash flow while continuously adjusting to the changing work environments driven by COVID. Through it all, we remained focused on meeting customer demand and delivering strong return to shareholders in the rapidly growing semiconductor market. Brand will have much more to highlight on the financials for both the quarter and the year, but I'd like to hit on a few of the annual milestones. For the year, KLA revenue grew 15% to $6.1 billion, marking the fifth consecutive year of growth. We also delivered notable profitability growth with non-GAAP operating profit and non-GAAP earnings per share, increasing 28% and 32% respectively year over year. Our free cash flow grew 44% to $1.8 billion, and we returned $1.2 billion to shareholders through share repurchases and dividends. In the December quarter, we saw diversified strength across each of our segments. Semiconductor process control revenue was once again above plan. The electronics, packaging, and components group met its target, and our services business continued and delivered another quarter of growth and strong operating leverage. We ended the year with strong backlogs 
setting the stage for double-digit growth in 2021 as we continue to execute at a high level. We're operating from a position of strength in our marketplace, and given the accelerated growth of our serve markets, we remain solidly on track to meet and likely exceed our 2023 financial targets. All this reflects the dedication of our global teams and the enabling role KLA plays in our customers' technology roadmaps and enhancing their return on capital investment. Moving to today's demand environment, which continues to demonstrate accelerated adoption of several semiconductor and electronics industry growth drivers that we've been highlighting for the past few years, technology continues to transform how we live and work, and the data-driven economy is fundamentally changing how businesses operate and deliver value. This digital transformation is enabling secular demand drivers such as high-performance computing, artificial intelligence, and rapid growth in new automotive electronics and 5G communications markets. Each of these secular trends are driving investment and innovation in advanced memory and logic semiconductor devices, as well as new and increasingly more complex advanced packaging and PCB technologies. With our market leadership and process control and growth and expansion to new markets like specialty semiconductor process equipment, PCB, and finished dye inspection in our EPC group, KLA is essential to enabling our increasingly digital world. As much as things have changed over the past year, one thing that's remained a constant is our KLA operating model. KLA operating model is the enduring framework that we rely on to guide the execution of our long-term strategic objectives. We deploy the KLA operating model to align the company on a consistent strategy, tie accountability to results, drive product development execution, respond to changing market conditions, and facilitate continuous improvement while ensuring the company operates with strong fiscal discipline as we pursue our long-term performance and profitability objectives. Let's turn now to five top highlights in our results for the quarter and for 2020. First, we saw continued strength and breadth in foundry logic demand in the quarter. As expected, memory demand also grew as memory customers plan for growth and equipment investment in 2021 to meet improving end demand. We expect higher business levels across a broader set of customers in the March quarter, with demand momentum continuing throughout 2021 across our major end markets. The strength in demand we're seeing reflects KLA's essential role in supporting our customers' drive to innovate and continue to invest in future technology nodes. Second, we're seeing strong momentum in the marketplace from new products, driving market growth and share opportunities in both the semiconductor process control and EPC groups. Fueled by expanded customer investment in EUE lithography, the semiconductor process control business is driving adoption with new applications in optical inspection portfolio, such as EUV print check for Gen 5, and expanding our share in new markets for KLA, including the ESL-10 eBeam inspection platform, and the nascent use of X-ray technologies for metrology applications. Third, our services revenue grew to $1.56 billion, or 25% of total sales in 2020. This is driven by growth in our installed base, higher utilization rate, and increasing expansion of service opportunities in the trailing edge and in the EPC group. The strong results delivered in 2020 show how the services team continues to do a fantastic job leveraging the KLA operating model to deliver at a high level. Working in close collaboration with customers and partners, the services business innovated and drove new initiatives against the unprecedented challenges of COVID. Not only did our services business receive praise from our customers, but it also grew share of wallet. And we've seen our contact penetration steadily increase in 2020 from 70 to 75% plus which fuels recurring revenue streams and generates strong operating leverage and cash flows. Fourth, this was a very encouraging year for the newly established EPC group, demonstrating success in KLA's growth strategies and highlighting how execution of the KLA operating model drives market leadership and improved operating leverage in acquired businesses. Revenue growth was strong, and we believe that on a net basis, we'll exceed our $50 million annual acquisition cost synergy target by at least another additional $30 million. With EPC, KLA is now providing a more comprehensive and broader product portfolio and addressing fast-growing new markets in the electronics value chain, such as RF, 
automotive, 5G wireless connectivity, and display. Relative to the adoption of 5G, KLA has exposure to many key components in the electronics value chain as well. The EPC group ended the year with record backlog, backlog setting the stage for double-digit growth in 2021 and for incremental operating margins on that growth in line with the total company model. Finally, in keeping with our commitment to deliver strong and predictable capital returns to our shareholders, in the December quarter, we repurchased $177 million of common stock and paid $140 million in dividends. Back in July, KLA's board of directors authorized the 11th consecutive annual dividend increase to a yearly run rate of $3.60 per share. Since inception in 2006, KLA's dividend payout has grown at a CAGR of approximately 15%. In 2020, KLA returned $1.23 billion to shareholders, or 70% of free cash flow. Before Bren gets into the greater detail of our financial highlights, let me briefly summarize. Despite the disruption and unforeseen challenges that persisted throughout the year associated with COVID, KLA has benefited from the resourcefulness of its global workforce. We've adapted well, and we end 2020 in a position of strength while delivering record results and set the stage for the sixth consecutive year of growth. KLA is exceptionally well positioned at the forefront of technology innovation with a comprehensive portfolio of products to meet the demanding customer requirements which balance sensitivity and throughput. The semiconductor and electronics landscape is constantly changing. and We're seeing broadening customer interest which is being applied to more technology innovation than ever before at the leading edge. We believe the secular factors driving industry demand that we identified at our last investor day are even more relevant now than they were then. And this will help us to meet and likely exceed our 2023 financial targets. At the same time, our strategy of driving diversified growth with strong long-term operating leverage should provide consistent capital returns to our shareholders. And with that, I'll pass the call over to Bren. Thanks, Rick, and good afternoon, everyone. KLA's December quarter and 2020 results highlight the soundness and strength of our ongoing strategy. We continue to demonstrate our ability to meet customer needs and expand our market leadership while growing operating profits, generating record free cash flow, and maintaining our long-term strategy of productive capital allocation. 2020 was a year of strong growth and profitability across multiple areas of our business. All of this was accomplished while simultaneously continuing to return high levels of capital to shareholders. Total revenue in the December quarter was $1.65 billion, the very top of the guided range for the quarter of $1.51 to $1.66 billion. Non-GAAP gross margin was 61.8%, slightly below the midpoint of the guided range for the quarter of 61% to 63%. Non-GAAP EPS was $3.24 solidly above the midpoint of the guided range of $2.82 to $3.46. GAAP EPS was $2.94. At the guided tax rate of 13%, non-GAAP EPS would have been $0.03 cents higher, or $3.27. Total operating expenses were above the guided range of $393 million, including $228 million of R&D expense and $165 million of SG&A. Non-GAAP operating income as a percent of revenue was strong at 38% and in line with expectations. The higher operating expenses in the quarter were due in part to adjustments in variable compensation programs, as well as the timing of prototype material purchases for product development programs. Based on revenue expectations for 2021, product development requirements, particularly in programs supporting next generation reticle inspection capabilities, and the regionalization of additional customer engagement resources, we expect operating expenses to be approximately $400 million in the March quarter, and we are budgeting quarterly operating expenses roughly within the range of $400 to $405 million over the near-term horizon. Given top-line expectations for 2021, we expect that the business will continue to outperform its target operating model in terms of overall profitability and operating margin leverage. Other interest and expense in the December quarter was $43 million, and the effective tax rate was 13.8%. Though we always have some variability in our tax rate, given the timing and impact of discrete items and the geographic distribution of revenue and profit, we believe it is prudent to adjust our long-term tax planning rate up slightly to 13.5% going forward. 
Of course, we are monitoring the corporate tax discussions in the United States and will provide updates on how those will affect or would affect KLA as appropriate in the future. Non-GAAP net income was $504 million. GAAP net income was $457 million. Cash flow from operations was $561 million. And free cash flow was a record at $502 million. This resulted in a free cash flow conversion of nearly 100% and a very healthy free cash flow margin of just over 30%. Our segment revenue is strong in the quarter, driven by growth in our semiconductor process control business. The EPC group delivered results in line with our model heading into the quarter. Revenue for the semiconductor process control segment, including its associated service business, was $1.38 billion, a sequential quarterly increase of 9% and up 15% for 2020. Approximate customer segment mix is as follows. Foundry was strong, as expected, at 49%. Logic was 10%. And memory grew to 41% from 32% in the December quarter. Within memory, the business was roughly 60% NAND and 40% DRAM. Going forward, we will, be, we will be combining the Foundry and Logic segments into one category to remove some of the noise as to whether a customer is in one category or another given the various markets they serve and to better align with industry reporting practices. Revenue for the specialty semiconductor process segment in December was $91 million, up 2% sequentially, and up 24% in 2020. Demand in this segment was driven by growth in RF, MEMS, and advanced packaging. PCB display and component inspection revenue was $179 million, down 1% sequentially, but up 12% for 2020, as strength in PCB and component inspection offset a weaker business environment in the display business. In terms of balance sheet highlights, KLA ended the quarter with $2.3 billion in total cash, total debt of $3.46 billion, and a flexible and attractive bond maturity profile supported by investment grade ratings from all three agencies. From a cash flow and capital returns perspective, during the December quarter, we repurchased $177 million of common stock and paid $140 million in dividends. In 2020, KLA returned $1.2 billion to shareholders or 70% of free cash flow, including $547 million in dividends paid and $681 million in share repurchases. We believe our track record for delivering strong capital returns is a key component of the KLA investment thesis and offers predictable and compelling value creation for our shareholders. As it relates to guidance as we begin the new year, our view is that the fat wafer fab equipment or WFE market will grow in the mid-teens plus or minus a couple of percentage points in 2021, off a baseline of 59 to 60 billion. 2021 is expected to be a year of strong demand and growth across our major end markets, with the strongest percentage growth coming in memory, led by DRAM investment and with Foundry Logic delivering another year of solid growth. Looking ahead, based on our current backlog, sales funnel visibility over the next couple of quarters, and product lead times, we are encouraged by the sustainability of our current demand profile for the year. As a result, we would expect the company revenue to be roughly consistent quarter to quarter across the year. Our March quarter guidance is as follows. Total revenue is expected to be in a range of 1.74 billion plus or minus 75 million. Foundry logic is forecasted to be about 68% of semi process control systems revenue. Memory is expected to be approximately 32%. We forecast non-GAAP gross margin to be in a range of 61.25 to 63.25% as we expect a richer product mix, continued service leverage, and higher volume will lead to improved gross margins compared to the December quarter. Based on revenue and product mix expectations for 2021, we are modeling gross margins between 61.5% and 62% in 2021. Given the structural trends in our business and in both cost and product positioning, my bias today is to the high end of this range. Other model assumptions include operating expense of approximately 400 million, interest and other expense of approximately 43 million, and an effective tax rate of approximately 13.5%. Finally, gap diluted EPS is expected to be in a range of $2.98 to $3.66, and non-gap diluted EPS in a range of $3.23 to $3.91. 
The EPS guidance is based on a fully diluted share count of approximately 155 million shares. In closing, the end market dynamics driving semiconductors and investments in WFE remain compelling, with solid demand across end markets and at multiple technology nodes. 2021 is setting up to be a second consecutive year of double-digit growth for both WFE and KLA. KLA is executing well with continued confidence that we are on track to meet and likely exceed our 2023 financial targets. The KLA operating model positions us well to outperform and also guides our strategic objectives. These objectives fuel our growth, operational excellence, and differentiation across an increasingly more diverse product and service offering. They also underpin our sustained technology leadership, deep competitive moat, and strong track record of free cash flow generation and capital returns to shareholders. With that, I'll turn the call over to Kevin to begin the Q&A. Kevin? Thanks, Brian. Uh, Priscilla, if you could uh, provide the instructions for Q&A. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you wish to remove yourself from the queue, you may do so by pressing the pound key. We remind you to please unmute your line when introduced and, if possible, pick up your handset for optimal sound quality. In the interest of time, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. We'll now take our first question from Patrick Ho with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, and a belated Happy New Year, and congrats to you guys. Uh, Rick, maybe first off, in terms of process control intensity, we've seen uh, Foundry Logic continue to grow as we go through these node migrations, and NAND Flash has obviously seen uh, intensity rise with uh, the increasing layer counts. As we look at DRAM and the projected pickup uh, that you mentioned in your prepared remarks, what types of process control intensity increases are you seeing in that marketplace? Uh, you know, maybe even excluding some of the EUV uh, uh, options that are out there, what other types of process control intensity trends uh, are increasing in DRAM? Uh, sure. Uh, I think that they're, you know, if you think about DRAM, what they've really been pushing on, and it's very difficult, as you know, to, to do it, is to continue scaling, and we do think that there's going to be some EUV that comes in, but, but there's no question that there's scaling happening, and of course that drives uh, more process control intensity. The other thing that's pretty clear in DRAM is the overlay requirements continue to get more and more challenging, so we're seeing increased uh, trying to understand of, you know, how to, how to squeeze more capability out of the lithography sets that they've got. And then you know, we do see some, as I say, EUV adoption, so we think there'll be incrementally more focus on our more advanced optical inspection tools to be able to support that. So that's what we're seeing as a trend. It's not necessarily, obviously, as EUV heavy as what we'd see in Foundry Logic, but uh, there is some element of EUV in there. Does that answer your question, Patrick? It does, Rick. Thank you. Uh, Brent, as a, a follow-up uh, to, to that question, uh, you guys, as you're seeing demand pick up and revenues grow, your working capital metrics have actually also improved. W what changes have you made, particularly uh, given that you've added Orbitech over the last two years, but you see the inventory turns uh, actually uh, improving even as demand picks up? What are some of the dynamics there? Well, hey, Patrick, it's a great question, uh, and certainly adding Orbitech in, and I think we've done a pretty good job of improving overall asset velocity in that business so far. I think there's there's room for us to improve it going forward. But on the KLA side, one of the, the areas where you could argue that, you know, we, we uh, I think we, uh, we do something in our business to, to support, and, and I think we get paid for it in terms of our profitability, but to support our model, both in terms of the the component differentiation we have that drives our differentiation of our products, but also that enables our service business. So we've always tended to carry a lot of inventory because we're supporting these tools that last a long time in the field. And we also have, have very exclusive relationships in a lot of our key supplier uh, relationships that, that, uh, that, that help us, as I said, protect differentiation. So as a result of all that, it does drive higher inventory commitments and, and, and we carry that risk, if you will, although we never get stuck with extra systems, and, and given the strength of the service business, uh, we tend to move the parts. So we think it's a, it's a uh, 
a good sacrifice to make. We think we get paid for it in terms of, of the profitability and structure of our business. And the volume we've seen has allowed us to improve it a little bit. Uh, it's, this is not a turns business for the most part, so I think it's probably an upper limit to it. But we have, uh, we do focus on it, and I think we have improved it a little bit over time. Thank you very much. We'll take our next question from Joe Quattrochi with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking the question. I wanted to go back to your comment about revenue should be uh, relatively consistent quarter to quarter in 2021. Is that a process control tool comment as well? I guess what I'm trying to understand is, you know, what you're seeing relative to maybe peers talking about WFE being a little bit more first half weighted. Yeah, Joe. So it's a good question. So what we were trying to do, first of all, it's it's really for for both groups of our business. Uh, if you look at the EPC group and as well as the uh, process control equipment part of the business. I was really trying to do a few things. First, obviously, we're guiding March, and we've got a, a nice sequential increase to the March quarter. We wanted to provide our view of, of WFE growth for 21 and expectations for KLA in the year. And the third thing was to provide just some context on the demand profile as we move through the year. And, and as I said in the prepared remarks, it looks relatively consistent. Now, I'm not guiding the June quarter, I'm not guiding September, I'm not guiding December, but what I wanted to do is provide a little bit more context. Now, we do have tools that cost from 10 to $20 million, sometimes even more than that. So there is the usual variability that you have related to the timing of a shipment, a customer acceptance, a consignment buyout, and so on. But when we look across our business, it looks relatively consistent from a demand profile point of view. And I think starting with the, the backlog we have, the visibility we have in the funnel, and then just the general lead time dynamics of our products, uh, it gives me some comfort with, uh, with that statement. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, and then you talked about, you know, the investments you're making on the product development side, and clearly you guys are, you know, strongly outperforming your long-term profitability targets. So I was curious, you know, how do you think about opportunities to maybe even spend a little bit more and accelerate, you know, some of the product development projects you've got going on? Sounds like you've been talking to some of our guys inside that I think sometimes Rick and I are the only two people in the company who think we ought to spend less. But anyway, to, to, to answer your question, Look, we have a rigorous process where we look at the portfolio of the business and, and look at, at how we get returns on that portfolio. So we've ramped up our investments in R&D and product development uh, over the, the last few years. We think that there are opportunities. Uh, one of the biggest drivers that's driving the uptick that, that I articulated here as we look at 21 is investment in multiple uh, programs supporting reticle inspection uh, uh, qual uh Reticle inspection, qualification, and so on. So, so I think that that's been uh, an area of focus for us. But, but we feel pretty comfortable with our process around R and D and the timing of, uh, of of our roadmap relative to our customer requirements. And uh, it's worked pretty well for KLA. I think what's driving more of our model upside is more of a gross margin dynamic than a than a cost dynamic. And so I think the gross margin is reflective of the differentiation that we have with our products in the field and and. Uh, you know, I think the value we're adding to, to our customers. So hopefully that, that answers your question. That's perfect. Thank you. We'll take our next question from CJ Muse with Evercore. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you for taking the question. Um, I guess two questions, if I could put them together. Uh, the first one would be uh, around EUV shortages at ASML. Is that impacting uh, Gen 5 optical demand at all? And then I guess secondly, I'm a little bit surprised that you're guiding Orbitech businesses, you know, flat half on half. Typically there's seasonal uplift into the back half. I'm curious um, if, if that's a conservative outlook, whether seasonality has changed or, or, or there's something that we should be kind of thinking about. Thank you. Yeah, CJ, um, nicely done. Those are not related at all. Uh, those two questions, as you know, but I will take them. The first one, no, we don't see any slowdown in the EUV uh, impact, if, if the delays that were outlined by uh, by ASML in terms of uh, the demand for Gen 5. If anything, it's kind of gone the other way. Um, what's happened in the last few months is I think the realization that some of the yield challenges associated with the EUV are best, appro uh, best addressed by having more Gen 5 capacity. And so 
we're actually maxed out and, and, uh, and trying to ramp that in order to support it. So we have very strong Gen 5. We don't see any delay in that. And we have a lot of conversations with customers about, uh, about our ability to fit to support that. In terms of Orbitech, in, in terms of that, you, you know, it's a, it's a complicated business overall to, to aggregate. And so we don't really see anything, uh, any signs of concern. We do see continued growth in that business. We feel good about where we set out our plans for 2023 in terms of the original model that we outlaid at the investor day, uh, and we're on track to, to meet or exceed those, so we feel good about it. Um, we'll have to see. This is a little bit newer for us to, to understand this, the dynamics of, of the Orbitech business, but we feel good about the signs that we're seeing, and as we said, we ended with strong backlog coming out of 2020, so we feel really good about this year. So, CJ, the only thing I'll add to that is we weren't guiding it right. This still has the same variability you see um, quarter to quarter as is, you know, at, at a different, obviously, order of magnitude than our semiconductor process control equipment business. But if you look at what's driving the business overall between 5G infrastructure, mobile and 5G handsets, some of the dynamics within specialty, uh, and then just all, all the, the, the overall PCB dynamics and how it's, it's changing relative to to, uh, to integration and packaging and, and high performance computing. It's, all of that is driving some nice growth in those businesses. So while the display business is, is I expect a down year in 21 versus 20, the other businesses are, are more than making up for it. So I think that overall it, it, looks, uh, it looks pretty consistent uh, more or less as we move through the year. Great, thank you. We'll take our next question from John Pitzer with Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for letting me ask the question. First one's for Brent, but I'm wondering if you just get into a little bit more detail around what happened to mix in the December quarter that, you know, drove gross margins a little bit light relative to revenues being at the high end of the range. And as we look out beyond March, are there any other mix considerations we should think about as we think about gross margins? Yeah, John, it, it's the usual quarter-to-quarter -quarter variability. So it was a little bit le weaker in the December quarter, and you see a bit of a bounce back into the March quarter. So we were 20 basis points below, and we just guided uh, 25 basis points over uh, over the midpoint or over that 62 uh, level. And as, as I look at the next uh, several quarters and, and why I put the comments in, in the prepared remarks that I feel like we're we're operating in the 61 and a half to 62 range. So it was really just a, a function of the the products that actually revenue in the quarter. It's a customer acceptance uh, timing dynamic and, and not any other reason. That's helpful. And then Rick, as my follow-up, maybe I'll go back to, to the memory question that Patrick asked first, but ask it a little bit differently. If, you know, if we're doing the math right, December quarter memory was, was, was a new record. You have to go back to kind of June of 18 to see memory this high. And as you know, we in the investment community, you know, always think about that space as being kind of hyper cyclical. You know, we're, we're willing to underwrite some of the structural drivers in logic foundry, but maybe not as much in memory. When you look at the, the level of memory business today, how do you kind of parse out where we are in the quote unquote CapEx cycle for memory versus some of the structural drivers you, you outlined in, in Patrick's answer? Yeah, John, I think, um, as, as you know, since we're, we're a little more dependent on technology transition than we are to volume, our answer is a little different because it has more to do with the, the migration and the yield challenges associated with advanced nodes. And, and what we see that is a pretty steady commitment toward additional capability to drive next generation, and we're seeing that from multiple players. So I think like a lot of things in this industry, KLA's exposure is uh, there's less variability in it based on, on that fact. And so the, the volume considerations associated with CapEx impact us less than that. And maybe Bren can give some color on how that looks for the as we go out through the year. Well, John, it was fairly weak for most of 2020. And we saw this, this increase in the December quarter, which had some breadth to it. And we, we expected to see that, so we weren't surprised by it. Uh, and then as we look at 21, we, we expect to see growth uh, growth overall. Uh, we articulated our view earlier about just, you know, we think that, you know, the DRAM market overall probably grows at a higher percentage level than uh, than the flash market. But we would expect to see see growth in the business in, into 21. But 
been pretty disciplined. So, you know, seeing it uh, bounce back in the December quarter and some sustainability here at, at uh, these levels as we move through the, the, the first part, at least here of 21, it, uh, it's encouraging. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Krish Sankar with Cowan and Company. Your line is open. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my question. I have two of them, too. Rick, uh, just to follow along the thought process on memory, you know, it seems like KLA, the way it is today, is relatively more exposed to NAND than DRAM. Do you think that exposure or process control intensity increases in DRAM as DRAM goes more EUV? And if so, how should you think about KLA's revenue mix? And then I have a question follow-up. Yeah, I mean, I think that the uh, the differences are pretty slight, you know, in terms of what the drivers are. It's actually different products that are getting impacted. Uh, so if you think about DRAM, we're more, you know, obviously scaling is more of a factor there, and so you'll see more of, of what we're doing in terms of uh, whether it's Gen 5. Uh, you don't really see that in, in what's going on in NAND, but you do have some of the new products. We talked about the X-ray technology is really more applicable for that, some of the challenges associated with metrology, and even how it impacts our bare waiver business, our surf scan business, because the flatness requirements and the cleanliness for wafers for NAND uh, really get exacerbated when you think about the kind of uh, verticality that the, those dimensions are going through and the, the stress that that puts on the, uh, the semiconductor producer for them to be able to manage the yield. So they're different. I think the intensity at this point is slightly higher in the NAND than in the DRAM, but they're both kind of increasing at similar amounts. Got it, got it. The only thing I, I, I would add on DRAM is, is, is with the introduction of EUV, and we'll have to see how that plays out, it does drive some infrastructure. Now, you know, that's one level of investment, and is that sustainable over time is, is I think, a challenge for our teams. But, but as customers start to deploy EUV, uh, it will require EUV-related infrastructure to, uh, uh, to, to to help manage that. So that that's a factor that's out there that that that's also a maybe a change moving forward. Fair enough, Brian. And then uh, I have a follow-up for you uh, on uh, services. In the shareholder letter, you spoke about how the services attach rate grew from 70 to over 75 percent through the course of last year. I'm just curious, how high can it realistically get? Or put it another way, service is running at 25% of total sales. Can it get to over 30%? Thank you. Well, Chris, it, it will. It's two separate questions. It, it will because it's growing faster than than the underlying systems business. If you look at our service model, uh, it's you know it's a lot, nine to 11% growth rate, which is uh, what we articulated investor day, and I'd argue that. Certainly, the, the increase in demand we've seen on the system side gives us a tailwind to that growth rate moving forward. There's clearly customers are valuing the service offerings, particularly as you're seeing more and more demand at the trailing edge and the, the need for those customers to keep those tools up. A lot of those customers, particularly around automotive, are facing increasing reliability requirements, and that's driving more investment uh, in process control and, and the information that comes off the tools. So those have all been good drivers for us. Uh, so I, I keep thinking, you know, look, 80%, 85%, I think that's probably uh, reasonable to think that we could aspire to get there. There's always dynamics with certain customers that prefer a billable model. And uh, so we'll have to uh, to deal with that resistance to try to move to a contract structure. At the end of the day, contract structures allow us to optimize the cost structure underneath, and we can serve to an entitlement level that drives higher through cycle profitability. So that's what we aspire to. So I, I think... I think there's opportunities, but I think there's always going to be some limit to it where customers are going to, uh, some customers are prefer a global structure to parts of their install base. Just to add to it, I mean, the one other factor is the tools that are being shipped today, the complexity is such that, you know, if you think about a car analogy, it's pretty hard to service your own car today. Uh, Fifteen years ago, it might have been different. And so, you know, you think about over time, the complexity and the associated more and more of our systems end up having more and more custom design parts throughout the system, and it just becomes much more economical to rely on us. And then there's no question that a service model, a customer benefits from having a contract over the long term. They, they take the risk out of uh, episodic events, and they have more reliability of uptime. So I, I agree with Brent. I think it, it goes up over time. But 
nothing moves particularly fast in the services world given the size of the installed base. So it takes a little time for, for that number to keep creeping up. But we, we're firmly condensed and committed to, to driving it. Very helpful. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Vivek Arya with Bank of America. Your line is open. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I have the two as well. Uh, first is, uh, you know, if, if I take your uh, March quarter outlook and kind of annualize it, suggest this calendar year growth in line with uh, WFE uh, growth. But when I look at some of the investments uh, that are being made in five and then three nanometer on, on the foundry side and then the, you know, DRAM, which is more kind of uh, logic-like, I'm curious, what are the prospects of outgrowing uh, WFE? I, I guess it's the process control intensity question just asked uh, in a different way. Like, what, what would help you grow above or below WFE this year? Well, when I look at it, Vivek, I, I think that there's, uh, I mean, you have a little bit more memory investment this year than, than in 20, and so that's, uh, that puts downward pressure on process control intensity. But you're right about the opportunities in Foundry Logic and some of the product offerings that we expect to have uh, over, over the course of 2021. So when I look at it, and, and I think I think that we will at least perform in line with the market. I would expect that we'll probably do a little bit better. Uh, there's some headwinds and some tailwinds as we look at at 21. But overall, I think that that's where process control intensity kind of plays out. And then and then from a share, if we execute, I think there's probably some opportunities for some modest share improvement as well. So I would think KLA's share of WFE is probably flat to to, to slightly up as we as we look at 21 uh, from where we sit today. Got it. And a uh, follow-up, you know, is a question on um, cash um, returns to shareholders. Your profitability is very analog, uh, semi-like, right, almost 37 38% operating margins. But uh, free cash flow returns um, are, you know, do leave a, a lot more uh, room for uh, improvement. Even when I look at the buybacks that you had in December, uh, they were somewhat lower than, than the average we, uh, we have seen in, in the last uh, two years. So I'm curious, how are you looking at cash returns uh, going uh, forward if you're going to have such strong growth uh, this year and, and the longer-term trends are there? Uh, why not look at, um, you know, 100% free cash flow returns and looking at uh, uh, boosting dividends or, or the buyback? Well, so you could go back to Investor Day, and, and I think even over over time, it, every time we get the question, we've been very explicit about how we think about the uh, about capital allocation in the company, and our belief that that in generally cash doesn't get valued unless it's, produ it's deployed productively. And and so when you look at, at what we're doing going forward, we expect that at a minimum we'll be able to return 70%, and investors can model uh, model that as they think about the. Uh, the returns profile over time. Uh, we were right around that this year, but this was a little bit of a unique year with some of the COVID dynamics at the beginning of the year. Um, we did build our cash balance a little bit, but you're right, given the growth of the business, I would expect that that we, we can deploy more. Um, we do an exhaustive exercise here to understand uh, the liquidity of the company and, and how much cash we need to run it. And uh, we're operating at that level today. And so, you know, we have to juxtapose those alternatives against opportunities for growth in the company, and I think we've done a pretty good job with that. But generally, um, you know, I think the 70% tends to be, be a floor, and given the uptick in the business that we're describing, I would expect our quarter-to-quarter -quarter share repurchasing to increase uh, as we go forward here. Now, on the dividend side, A, we've, we've raised it 11 years in a row, 35% or so payout ratio target. Uh, through cycle to enable us to continue to raise it year in year out and have a payout ratio that gives us the ability to do that and even raise it in, in difficult years. We're going to grow it in line with the growth rate and free cash flow. And so over time, you can expect that the dividend payout ratio will grow uh, roughly in line with uh, with the growth and free cash flow. So that's our model and, and we'll, we do our, our exercise here and each year and, and we'll continue to do it that way. I don't think anything's changed. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Sydney Ho with Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. 
Uh, great. Thank you uh, for taking my question. My first question is on uh, China. I think China was, uh, if my math is right, the China revenue was down about 20% quarter over quarter after a pretty good uh, third quarter, but still up very solidly for, uh, for the year by 20%. What are your expectations for your opportunity in China this year? So I would expect WFE in China to be flat to up. I'm looking at our business levels, and they, they, they match that. So it, uh, I would say it's very consistent with the profile of 20, maybe a little bit better. And it's different customers okay. uh, that are investing, but in general, that's, that's how we see it. Okay, great. Uh, maybe my follow-up question is related to your target model. You printed offering margin 38%, guiding up uh, to 39 plus, uh, well ahead of, you know, of your target model, and it sounds like you're comfortable that you will continue to exceed that. But are there things that we should be aware of that may bring down operating margin as your revenue continue to grow in the next few years in terms of either cost of goods sold side of things, gross margin, obviously, or offering expenses side that may try to normalize a little bit over the next few years? Thanks. Well, there's always quarter to quarter fluctuations, but when you look at our long term plan of growing our top line at least, you know, set in the 7 to 9% range and dropping one and a half times that revenue growth rate in terms of EPS growth. But that drives effectively an incremental operating margin that's, you know, between 40 and 50 percent. And that's how we're going to run the company over time. So you always have the drivers that influence margin, you know, gross margin, whether it's a product mix. Obviously, service has a dilutive element at the gross margin line. But we factor that into how we think about the model and we put out there. So, yes, we're outperforming the, the public model. I think the strength and the speed of the growth that we've seen in the last couple of years has helped drive a fair amount of leverage in the business. Uh, and I think that a lot, of, as I said earlier and said in the prepared remarks, a lot of it's sustainable. So uh, that's our model, and, and we're, we're outperforming it uh, and expect to on, uh, you know, over the next uh, number of quarters, as, as I outlined. Great. Thank you. take our next question from Timothy R. Curry with UBS. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Thanks a lot. Um, Brent, I'm sorry. You might have already um, talked about this, but I, but I actually jumped on late. So it seems like if you're going to hold WFE share pretty flat, which I think is pretty reasonable in the 6.3 or 6.4 range, um, it seems like process control shipments are going to be – or um, revenue is going to be in the 1.05 range for March, and then it's going to sort of – stay in that range throughout the rest of the year. So you're not going to see this, you know, pronounced half on half decline that maybe some others will. Is that sort of the right way to think about the, you know, semi process piece? So Tim, yeah, you missed it. I, I covered it earlier and, and there were some prepared remarks that, that I, that I had that were about a sustained uh, or consistent demand profile over the next number of quarters. So um, that isn't guidance, but that was just to give some context on, on, on how we uh, how we see the year shaping up, um, notwithstanding the issue that we have around just general uh, ASPs of our tools that can cause some variability quarter to quarter. If you look at the the March quarter, uh, and and again we run the we guide one revenue number, but my expectations around the semi process control business are somewhere between 1.435 and 1.455, including service. So somewhere in that ballpark. Including service. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then, um, I had a question on NAND. So I know you don't have a ton of visibility there, but, but your commentary uh, that NAND is going to be sort of the weakest in terms of the you know relative end markets on a year-over-year -year, um, basis this year is kind of interesting. I think some others are beginning to try to you know try to say the same thing. It sounds like about flat is the growing consensus. Um, there was a pretty big budget flush from you know one of the big um, you know customers in the fourth quarter. So that was higher. But I guess my question is, is your view on that, is it because things have been cut? So because the procurement has been cut later on in the year as to why it's flat? Or is it because the number is the same, it just is off of a bigger base in, you know, 2020? Thanks. Yeah, I think there's some growth in NAND. It, it's uh, it's, it's a, the lowest percentage growth rate of the three segments that we articulated. So I think it's probably a mid-single digit type growth rate. Um, and, you know, that's obviously off of a bigger base as we look at 21. But it's not because things have been cut, Brent. That's what I guess. No. 
That's okay. not right. I'm not so sure I understand the question, but um, I think it's been fairly been fairly consistent, I think, here. I think it, it upticked a little bit in the second half, to your point, and, and I think that there's, you know, some growth next year off of, off of 20. Cool. Okay. Thanks much. We'll take our next question from Harlan Sir with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Great job on the quarterly execution and strong results. In, in 2019, in semiconductor process control, you guys gained about 300 basis points of share on the system side. Revenue-wise, you were about five times larger than your nearest competitor. It looks like your process control systems business grew about 17% in 2020. Do you guys think you sustained or gained overall process control market share in 2020? And in what areas do you think you drove the most share gains? And on your view of double digits percentage revenue growth in 2021, what are going to be the fastest growing segments within process control? Harlan, I think it, it kind of, uh, you know, there's kind of two ways to answer it. What, what were the end drivers for it and, and what were the products? And I say that because uh, EUV really drove a lot of our BVP performance, but it isn't necessarily the only thing BVP is used for. So, you know, we feel good about how we finished up the year. As you said, we gained share and we feel like we held it. We'll see what the final numbers come out. Um, but you remember at Investor Day, we were modeling uh, a slower growth in share than what we're actually seeing. Uh, so we feel really right. good about where we are in terms of the, the BBP adoption and had a very strong year in optical inspection in calendar 20. Uh, as you shift to 21, we feel like we're well positioned to continue to build on the share gains or process control adoption gains that we had again, based as much on end demand as some products that are coming to market that will continue to build that, plus continued adoption. Uh, the optical inspection strength is, is really remarkable, and we feel good about how we're positioned there. So I, I think that you're right. We gained more in 19 than in 2020. We held our gains, maybe built on it a little, and I think we're positioned to continue that, uh, that, that trajectory as we go towards our 23 plan, but certainly for 21. That's the way it the year's lining up. That's the way our build plans look right now. Yeah, the product families yeah, overall, all of them are showing growth. I would think that that uh, Rick talked a lot about uh, broadband plasma and the strength there. Uh, because of the, the memory uptick we're seeing, and, and after a couple of years now of digestion, we're seeing more patterned inspection or unpatterned inspection uh, investment. And so that's a, that, that's a good indicator both to support the wafer output, but also which in memory tends to drive wafers, so that drives that business. And then uh, the, the tool monitoring that, that is done with uh, unpatterned inspectors for any monitor waivers in memory. Uh, and then in reticle inspection, I'd expect to see growth uh, year over year um, above market kind of growth levels in that business as well. Great. Thanks for the insight there. And on the EPC side, you know, this brought very good diversification to the business. You know, going back to the 2019 analyst day, the team's outlook for EPC was kind of like a 9 to 10 percent CAGR, 1.4, 1.5 billion in revenues in 2023. Based on the results uh, that you that you put up in 2020, looks like you guys grew that business about 10, 11 percent if if you included the full quarter of Orbitech in your March uh, 2019 quarter. So good to see the team tracking two or slightly ahead of those targets. What type of growth are you guys expecting for EPC this year? Would it be more in line with that 9 to 10% CAGR that you've been targeting, or could it be more in line with the overall top-line growth of sort of mid-teens? And what segments are going to be driving the largest growth and any segments that will lag the growth? Sure, Harlan, great question. Uh, we do feel good about where we're positioned, and, and uh, as you know, I think we're – fully integrated now and feel really good about the message we have for our customers. I mentioned in prepared remarks, we feel good about the, the progress we've made on the synergies. Uh, you know, we have seen the target that we laid out in 2023, we're on track. But to your point, and Bren mentioned it, FPD will be down in calendar 21, which means, that, and, and we think overall the rest of the business, if you take out FPD, probably be up closer to 15%. So, and, and FED was relatively weak in, uh, in 20. So the parts of the business that were, I think, the most levered to in terms of advanced packaging and a lot of the work that's going on where we have overlap with some of our existing front-end customers, uh, really a lot of good progress and, you know, 
as you know, Rest Day is running that. Uh, I think he's confident that we can build on our success as we go forward based on the interactions that we're having with customers. We feel good about specialty. PCB has been great, and we've been really happy with the work that's going on in the, in the packaging inspection, the, the ICOS businesses. So those three are, are really hitting it and uh, feel really good about it. I also mentioned we're seeing the same operating margin leverage. Uh, obviously, those are lower profitability businesses, but they have a, the same leverage in the operating model as uh, the rest of KLA, so we feel good about that as well. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Harlan. Uh, Priscilla, it looks like we're coming up on time here. I think we have time for one last question. We'll take our final question today from Quinn Bolton with Needham & Company. Your line is open. Hey, guys. I, I somewhat addressed it in, in answering Harlan's question there, but, you know, was was looking at the uh, uh, wafer inspection business up at 32%. Just wondering if you could give a little bit more detail on what's what's driving that strength. Is it mostly Gen 5? Is it surf scan and, and in the script, I think you also mentioned some new applications and optical inspection. So I was just looking for some more color there. Yeah, it's really related, Quinn, to the, the optical inspection in Gen 4, Gen 5. So it's not just what we're seeing in Gen 5, but Gen 5 is certainly where we're seeing uh, the increased application around specifically supporting EUV. And and there that's a, we laid out that uh, that thesis at Investor Day, we hadn't really seen it at that time, that we thought the print check, so when customers will print down the EUV and they'll validate that image, that was going to be an application we believed there was a big market requirement for. That's proving to be true, and that's driving a lot of uh, the business success going forward. The other thing that's happening, of course, as EUV is becoming more prevalent than just in general scaling matters more, smaller defects, and that pushes the mix toward more Gen 5 than perhaps would have been Gen 4. So we're benefiting from both of those trends. New applications, additional scaling. Thank you. All right. Um, we appreciate everybody's time and interest, and I'll pass the call back over to Priscilla to, uh, to end. This concludes the KLA Corporation December quarter 2020 earnings call and webcast. Please disconnect your line at this time Goodbye. and have a wonderful day.